Yeah, welcome to the talk this evening. Um, just want to thank some people before we start. Shalice has been very helpful <laughs> in getting this thing going with me. And um, also, I um, just want to thank my colleague who um, I work with, Michelle, who helped me out today <laughs> with some stuff. Otherwise, um, you wouldn't be able to see any of my images. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I I just before I start, I was I was thinking that um, I've um, done quite a few of these talks recently um, in my in recent years. So I um, the actual history and the details and the story of of of, of how I um, came back to Cambridge is is pretty well documented on a couple of talks that I've done and they are actually on my website so um I'll, I'll speak about those later but what has also happened to me recently is that i've um i've written a very long piece about all the work i've done about cambridge in the last nearly 10 years now and um i've um so I'm going to read some of that this evening in lieu of sort of telling that story about um how i came back to Cambridge and, and um, became involved in the city again, etc. Um, the, um, and for anybody who doesn't know, I'll, I'll just brief, do a quick synopsis of, of some of the stuff that happened. You know, I, I, um, I've um, been doing work about Cambridge, like I say, for nearly 10 years now. I mean, it I wasn't my intention at the time. I thought it would be a one-off thing. Um, I was just intending initially to make a, a film. Um, I thought about sort of places from my childhood area, which is Arbury and King's Hedges. And um, I was going to juxtapose these things with them. Um, some of the artwork I'd done previously to that and just sort of see if there was some unconscious unconscious sort of connection between the between the two and um so um what's actually happened is that I've made um ended up making three short films one about the kite or the old kite area that I remember uh, one about sort of northern Barnwell, um, up off Newmarket Road along the riverside there, which is where a lot of my extended family used to live. And I also then made, a, I did eventually make my film about Arbury and King's Hedges as well, and they are very short films. So a lot of the work I've done in relation to that feeds into the films or is feeds off of the films, if you like. And... Um, so there they were my sort of primary focus um and um I've, I've done lots of things around all that sort of stuff you know i've ended up doing a series of i think it's now seven sort of solo exhibitions in cambridge at various locations and um initially there were they focused on three or four different areas um like i say there was barnwell the kite uh, Bring King's Edges and Mill Road and then the, the, the last few have been a bit more um, in depth about how I was changing the images and, and moving the imagery along for in relation to some of those areas as well and uh, so that's where I'm up to at the moment. The last exhibition I did recently in September was a um, I produced a series of images. They're a bit more abstracted in, in a sense, but um, I, I, I used some text from um, a book that uh, an author, Graham Davis, has recently written called Real Cambridge. And um, I was actually, I participated with him in, 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 in well, not in writing the book, but and in, he, he came and met me in Cambridge and I took him on a little, tour around Arbury and King's Hedges and we um, looked up some places that are normally hidden or you know tucked away that people really wouldn't know about but that seem to have some relevance both for me and they seem to for him as well and some of that um, 
walk was included in one of the chapters in his book. So there was a connection going on there. So that's uh, hopefully the work over this series of exhibitions has moved on and sort of expanded. Um, so that's just the synopsis, if you like. I thought what I'd do first is just briefly, I, like I said, I've done this piece of writing now and um, I've had it for a little while and sat with it and re-edited it and so forth. And I thought I'd just read a passage from that this evening or several passages, but just short passages just to, um, because it seems that it's taken some of the detail out of what I could explain in the talk and, and put it into context in relation to how I've done the work in relation to Cambridge. And also it's it began to include um, some of the people from my past and they, they cropped up in the writing as well. And that hasn't happened in the imagery is, is um, very much about places, but uh, the writing has included some of the people. So what I thought I'd do right now is just read one of these passages and it's the very start of this piece of writing. So if you just bear with me, I'll just get that and um, read that out to you and then we'll carry on with the talk afterwards. So this is the very beginning of the piece of writing and it starts, um, I want to write, but what about? I can only see this vague nebulous form, much the same as when I start a piece of art, a poem or begin a film. Here it is, the direction, the way forward. Can I go there, wherever there is? Questions, always questions. The past can erupt in the present. shape of things to come, sometimes through things that came before. You become a diver submerged in the sea of memories and forgotten chances. About 10 years ago, I was struck by such a moment. It was one of those that seemed to disrupt the fabric of life, opening a channel in my heart and mind, calling out, remember me. One lunchtime, I was walking around near my studio in South London when I came across a street that I hadn't really noticed before. The street contained a small parade of shops with a row of flats above, a locksmith's and newsagents, a cafe and a greengrocer's, complete with the fruit and veg displayed outside. The whole scene was so reminiscent of a place from my childhood. The sunlit yellowed brickwork of the council flats looked effervescent, giving the nearby state, estate a significance in the way only some places can emanate. Built to be used, now very lived in, its once smart appearance had given way to the urban progress of nature. The grass and plants peering through the paving and on the verges somehow matched the plants in the balcony boxes hanging in front of the doors. This place had seen years of life and lives passing through like a current from birth to death. In my mind, I saw Arbury Court, a three-sided square of shops with flats above, once so prominent in my young life in Cambridge. Even the warmth of the sun on that day added to the nostalgia and the sense of loss. How could I have forgotten this place, forgotten this part of my childhood, forgotten a large chunk of my own life? The moment hung like a flag before me, a radiant portal into the past. I was reawakened, alive from birth to the present. I look back and often wonder why this moment had such an impact on me or why it even occurred. But these seem like shallow questions in comparison to the internal shift that has happened since. I remembered I'd been happy in my childhood as well as sad. I'd been happy to be there in the warmth of those summers. My, my environment hadn't seemed so harsh and unrelenting as it became. Cambridge existed in Arbury and King's Hedges. This was the kingdom in which I lived. City centre was something other. A distant relative where distant things occurred. We were something other, unrelated to the class-centred striving that encompassed, encompassed the university. Our class was rich and earthy, tough and compassionate, all in one. This was the land of the farmer, the mechanic, the draftsman, the worker, the supermarket assistant. My mother had been a bedder at Corpus Christi College, along with my aunt, who got my mother the job. Before that, she'd briefly worked as an office cleaner, and after working at the college, she worked in Sainsbury's, along with myself and my brother. Before we were born, she had been a hairdresser who, along with her partners, had a shop on Green Street in the city centre. 
My father worked for Pi Telecommunications at Ditton Works, a large factory come office building on Newmarket Road opposite the city cemetery. My aunt also worked for Pi in the factory on St. A on St. Andrew's Road. I never thought this was a life destined for me, not that I'm better than these people, but I could not envisage myself doing a normal job. Indeed, it didn't work out that way. My journey through the education system channeled me towards an escape route away from Cambridge and its sense of middle-class conformity and working-class morality. Too many people gave me the impression that these things were just the way they were and nothing could change this. Maybe this was true to a degree, but there were boundaries to be tested before I could even think of entertaining this philosophy. So back to my moment. Once opened, this door has never closed and the swell of memories and emotions give clarity and a voice to the voyage through my past, which continues to this day. I was confounded by what I'd stumbled upon, even though it was part of me. Now, what was I gonna do with this profound resonance that had shaken my sense of self? As I sat in my studio looking at my paintings, I had the idea I would try and make a film incorporating images of my childhood alongside images from the present, i.e. the paintings. At the time, I was fascinated by two documentaries of Time and the City by Terence Davies and Joy Division by Grant G. Both of these dealt with the past as an entity, an ever-present thing. These films allowed me to wander around in someone else's memories and imagery. If I could even cl come close to producing this kind of powerful emotive experience, I would have come a long way in terms of furthering the journey I've been on with my art since I left Cambridge. My aspirations were far more small scale and since I had no idea how to make a film, this would certainly be a challenge. But once started, I'd soon found this thing had a momentum all of its own. So that was the, um, my introduction to, or reintroduction to Cambridge as it were, after many years of, um, not being here well I, I say that but you know i used i visited my family quite regularly and um, although that would be just a visit you know i wouldn't lurk around in the town center too long i had taught at cambridge many years ago for a couple of years so that again i was visiting um you know maybe once a week so i'd i'd um come down to teach but it'd be i'd come home early in the morning and leave in the evening so i wouldn't really interact with the town so i mean that thing there just describes how cambridge became re it came to the surface in my subconscious somehow through triggered through this memory of a street in that i came across in london you know and that took me back to arbury and back to my childhood and all that and um and like I say, everything else has really blossomed from that moment. You know, the, the film I was trying to make then that I described was a, the film about Arbery and King's Hedges. And um, what I ended up happening was the first film I ended up making was actually a film about the old kite, you know, just through a series of circumstances. And I won't go into the very long story about that, how that happened now. But, uh, you know, the kite was something that, obviously is very changed from when I lived in Cambridge. So I lived there in the 1960s, 70s up till 1982. So the Grafton Centre hadn't been built by the time I left Cambridge. So my memories of the kite are the very old Victorian area that it once was and the demolition that had gone on, you know, throughout the 70s and early 80s. So um, maybe if I now just pop up a few images of some some of the work I've done. I can I can talk as I show you the images, and I think the first ones on the on here are of the kite. So I'll just get those up and share those with you. So this is just a, um, oh, these are all the exhibition cards for uh, all the sort of seven exhibitions that I've done. That's just the frontispiece there. And it goes from the vessel, which was the very first one about the kite, Trace, which was about Barnwell, No Man's Land, which was about a uh, Mill Road, Frontier, Arbury and King's Hedges, and then the, the last three, Liminal, Absence and Marginal, the most recent one. So this is, 
This is um, some of my um, early drawings about the kite and they're very scribbly and they have these very dark sort of square rectangular shapes occurring on them, which is a hangover for some of the work I did before. I'd sort of draw and rub out and draw and rub out. And the actual shape of the kite, which is very ghost-like in there, is actually a, a map of the kite from 1979 or 80. Um, it's a bit clearer on this collage and you can see the map structure there again and this is another piece of work that was going along and these these works were all made at the same time I was making the film so it was they, like I say that things feed into each other and this is an etching which is a, of the same area and you can see much more clearly the um, the outline of the map there and um, the streets that are no longer there because the Grafton Centre has obviously taken up quite a chunk of that southern area of the kite there. And um, finally, in that, this is a um, one of the, this is a, like a sculptural box shape of the kite, which is my kind of mourning for that area as it no longer existed anymore. And I, I just thought I'd make this 3D container, which was empty. It's like a sort of box shape frame with a with, which is glazed and um, it just seemed to sum up the feelings of, of something that is lost um, so yeah that's um that was the kite i mean we can just quickly move on and i'll show you the uh, the next exhibition i i did was about um like i say northern barnwell i mean i was still sort of battling away with the, the thought about making my Arbery film, but um, suddenly I threw a set, another set of circumstances, Barnwell became a, an, an area which is very pressing and sort of, it pressed on my mind a lot. And I, I went back and re-explored that. So the, these are, this is an image I, I started to make and it's a, sort of moving on from the, the kite image. You can see the map of Barnwell here. Again, it's, it's, a, trend, it's a map from the, sort of late 60s, 1970, I can't remember. But anyway, I'd, 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 I readjusted some of the streets on there to make it look as though it was older and, and some of the areas that are obviously vanished. And, and this was another larger piece again. And it, it, um, it has the, um, the map appearing as a color shape in the middle there. Again, these black, sort of areas that have become very, well, they're not dominant, but they're, they're very obvious within it. Um, and then I started um, a series of photo etchings, which are taken from some of the film stills of the film I made about Barnwell. And I started making them into these, these small sort of prints. And I mean, in a sense, this is a, you know, the work is becoming very literal now. Of, for the very well, for the first time in in, in my sort of history, as in my own artwork, you know, this is about as literal as I've got with what some of my work. But you see the drawing, sort of scribbly, scratchy thing, going on, on the surface again. There's that large oblong black shape in in the top right hand corner, and this is actually the corner of the terrace where my grandmother lived, and my uncle lived on the other street, which is. Um, which runs down the other side here. Um, and then I made this, which is a um, view of Newmarket Road with and uh, blacked out some of these porticos, which are on the exterior of some of these houses, which were actually this terrace is very near to where my great grandparents lived, which is doesn't exist anymore now, but it was, it was very close to this location. And um, if I, just click on the next one. This was one of the previous prints I'd done um, just to show where this sort of black shape idea had come from. In the previous prints, it was, it was like this box-like structure, which is sat in the middle of this, um, this energetic sort of background here. And that was just to show where this, this sort of black sort of redactive things were coming from in these, in these prints that I'd done. And this is just a couple of shots of um, the Barnwell work, which was actually shown in the Leper Chapel in 2015. 
which was wonderful because the, the leopard jackal was actually part of the old Barnwell Priory. And so it's it brilliant to have this location to show this work. So I showed all this work and, and the film as well. You can see on the next slide, there's, a, there's the film in there, but it was, it was a really, it was a beautiful little event and it was a lovely space. And like I say, it's nice to show the work about Barnwell within Barnwell. And I think that was what was most in, one of the most interesting things about it. Um, I'll just stop sharing there for a sec, just come back here. Um, so, th yeah, I mean, the, the work goes on. I mean, the, the little places, like I say, they're very pertinent to me. They're very pertinent to, I tend to focus on these obscure little places that have, uh, only, they only tend to be places that have evoked memories in me, you know, in a, in a very strong sense. You know, so then people have obviously commented on this. They're not the usual thing you would associate with exhibitions or work about Cambridge. It's not the characteristic, you know, the King's College Chapel version of Cambridge. It's, it's a very personal thing for me, is what I'm trying to say. It, it's a very, um, all these places have a strong sense of memory for me, a strong sense of childhood things happen there, there's little stories which go with each of them, which is why I did the piece of writing, because there's obviously lots of stories that go all these places and, you know, it take me far too long <laughs> to go through them all with you this evening. But um, this is just to give you an idea about, you know, all the stuff I've been doing and, and, and how it's come into being and, you know, what it's all about. So um, we'll go back to the, the screen share again, and I'll go through some more images and talk through the particular places as we go along. So this is this is a drawing I did. I'd been work, trying to do the work about Arbery. I, by the time I'd made the work about Barnwell and um, the film about Barnwell, I'd also made the film about Arbery. So it was sort of sitting on the back burner as it were. Like, uh, carried on making some drawings about Arbery, which are very similar to the first ones I showed you. And then I, I, I this, the idea that of, um, this is a little photo collage of Arbery Court, but it, it came from me seeing an exhibition by Peter Kennard, who's a photo montage artist, who's very famous, well, he still is very famous, but he had um, anti-war images and work for C&D that he did in the late 70s and early 80s. And I'd seen this well, his retrospective exhibition and uh, it prompted me to think about doing work with very, you know, like I say, literal pieces like um, photographs and the photographic um, work you saw in some of the previous prints. So this is what's happening here. And then a guy, um, was setting up a cafe in, or he's involved in setting up the, the Edge Cafe, which is actually on Mill Road. And he, he'd seen these two exhibitions that I'd done and he said, would I be interested in doing some work for the cafe to show at the cafe about Mill Road? And, um, and Mill Road kind of plucked me out of my childhood and dragged me into my teenage years because that was a place that I'm associated more with that particular era of my life. You know, the Arbery and King's Edges Barnwell are very much concerned with my childhood. And then, like I say, Mill Road's much more concerned with my um, my um, teenage life. So I did start doing work about Mill Road and, and they did an exhibition there. And I'll show you some of the work of that. Again, I just picked this, this place is that I took, I, I was going to make a film about Mill Road, but um, so I shot a load of stills and I didn't end up making the film, but I used the stills in a lot of these images and drawings. And this place, very soon after I took this photograph, got developed and it was the Cambridge carpet shop down there, opposite the mosque somewhere and um, doesn't exist anymore. So I'm very glad I got some of these pictures. And, and I think this thing has happened a lot, you know, as I've, a lot of the pictures I shot maybe eight, nine years ago, I know some of those places don't exist anymore. They've been redeveloped, the things have changed, etc. So I'm glad I got the pictures of them as at the time. Um, this is a shot of the drawing of the bathhouse. I tried to sort of expand it a bit and just use a little bit of the photograph and they like expand the building out into the drawing. 
but that that evokes a lot of memories for me. Um, this one, I, this is one of my favourites. I love this building. I don't know why. You know, it just really was. It, it just absolutely sent me back in time when I saw this. So I've, I've done a lot of work about the, the Romsey Town Labour Club, which is sat on the corner of um, Mill Road and Coleridge Road. It's, 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 it looks in a pretty shoddy state at the moment. I don't know if they're going to save it or not, but I've done a whole load of work about this place because I, I, really, I really had a strong feeling for it, even though I've never been in there or anything. It's just the exterior of it reminded me of prompted so many memories and this is a this is a print i made of, of mr g's shop and I'm, i did a whole load of work about that as well but again you know this is another place that's recently vanished unfortunately in the in a fire in this case but this was a sort of a landmark a place in cambridge and a lot of people knew about it it was, a, it was an old electrical shop full of electrical goods stuffed full of electrical goods it's a fantastic place and um yeah so i eventually like i say all the arbory work was on the back burner and i eventually got to do the my arbory film and exhibition at the edge cafe and this is these are some of the prints of i did about arbory and king's hedges this is a place called nun's way which is a housing development there um, this is a place on the corner of um, St Kilda Avenue where there's a whole load of shops with a few little flats above and it's just these, I used to work for this um, news agency, they're delivering papers, well there was a news agency there, it's now a Tesco's, they took over all the shops and made it into one big Tesco's, but uh, this is why some of these images are very strong for me like I said I remember delivering newspapers there I'd go and get the papers for my parents and go to the sweet shop etc like that and there's a lot of memories around there it's lots of stories this is a shot of the um or a print of the old um it used to be they called the snow cat which is a a pub on with um which is um in Arbury Court it's now a um a Sikh um temple but it, when I was a kid, it was a, an old pub called the Snow Cat. It didn't have a very good reputation. But um, yeah, that was why that's there. A lot of memories for that. I did get asked to leave that pub <laughs> once, which is my claim to fame. Um, and this one, which is a, a shot of my father holding my brother, and my and that's me, and. Um, and we're pointing across the old railway line there, which is at the end of our road, just off King's Edges Road. And um, it's now the guided busway, but it was a branch railway line at the time. Um, and um, on the other side of the railway is another place I have a really strong feeling for. It's not there anymore. It's now the Science Park, but it was an old a derelict army depot, depot when I was a child from the Second World War where they sort of prepared vehicles for the D-Day landings, the US Marine, the US Army Depot initially, and then the British Army took it over, but it was derelict by the time I, I arrived in Cambridge. And it was a, this, this was, you know, it was, it was a place people loved to go and play. It was, it was muted and somewhat dangerous and things like that. And I can see it, I could see it out of my bedroom window looking across the railway gate. Um, and this is one of the, this is an old pillbox, which is actually still there in the midst of the science park, but it's all overgrown and that's it's just set by one of the drainage ditches, which, which runs through the science park. And, um, and um, you know, it's still there. And it's, um, this is one of the places Graham Davis and I went to visit when he, when he came on, um, when we were doing the walk, which was, uh, um, which has became part of his book. So I'll just stop sharing there. Um, I'm just going to quickly read another piece um, from my writing because it is about Arbury and um, I just thought I'd put this in there and read it out to you because it um, it kind of makes some of those places come to life for me, you know, and, and it may help you listening to it to actually see what was going on at the time to make me put some of those images into my work um, or read this. The Arbury Adventure Playground opened in 1974 on the large windswept 
playing field between Nuns Way and the small industrial estate on Kirkwood Road. At the time, the view north was unobstructed by buildings and you could see all the way to Histon. My father was a committee member, fundraiser and advocate for the Adventure Playground. We attended a variety of events to raise awareness and money to build the structure, including the Jim Carner, complete with horses, jump courses and coloured rosettes for the winners. I remember the woman who was organising the event riding her horse over to her house. I was allowed to sit on this vast beast while she led the animal up and down the road. Up there felt like the top of the world and I reveled in the thought that I'd been allowed to do this. The building of the playground took place in 1973 and 74. A lorry load of huge telegraph poles arrived and were driven into the ground by a pile driver so platforms could be erected between them. This was long before the health and safety protocols were as officious as they are nowadays, and children were allowed hammers, saws, ropes, and other various dangerous implements to build dens, swings, and other structures. The tall perimeter fence was built by volunteers, including my father and my brother, including my father, and my brother and myself spent the day helping him nail some of the vertical planks in place. Its rough wooden appearance would give the playground its nickname, the stockade. Nearby King's Hedges Road was like the end of the line in those days, a marginal hinterland with the Cambridge to St Ives rail line cutting across the farmlands and fields. At the time, King's Hedges Road came to an abrupt end just past the junction with Kirkwood Road, opposite the rail crossing that led to the farm. The railway line was the city boundary and my bedroom window looked out onto this semi-rural scene where cows would graze amongst the yellowed grass, large pylons and derelict ruins of the old army depot. The newly built King's Hedges School catered for the area and I started attending shortly after it opened in 1968. The school stood alone on the northernmost edge of the King's Hedges estate. Its sloping roof, half wooden facade and water tower were new and stark set against the fields which lay beyond the school fence. The school football team had a girl player, a rare sight in those days. In fact, there were two girl players, Fiona and Karen. Fiona was the more talkative of the two, whilst Karen was the better footballer, often far better than many of the boys. By 1974, my time at King's Hedges School was coming to an end and the Adventure Playground had its first open day, when many parents and children came to see what the newly built structure was all about. Fiona and Karen and I were hanging out in one of the ramshackle wooden dens that had been erected against the interior of the fence. We were having a great time together. Karen and I decided we liked each other, so we engaged in copious amounts of snogging, punctuated by smoking a packet of players number six, which we had obtained from a cigarette machine outside the post office. Fiona didn't seem to mind all this lustful activity, and I certainly felt like I was coming to coming of age in some way, although to use those words it would have been beyond me at the time. Nevertheless, it was a memorable moment from my childhood. The trouble was I did very little with it and sometime later was shocked to find out from Fiona that Karen had been waiting for me to call or call round to see her. I hadn't realised this, this is what you were supposed to do. I mean, I was only 11. I felt like my naivety showed itself then and continued to make frequent appearances throughout my life. For some time afterwards, I would sit outside Karen's house on my bicycle, waiting to catch a glimpse of her or for her to see me. But the time had passed, things had moved on and we went off to different secondary schools. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, this illustrates you know why these some of these places mean so much to me they're like opening up a an advent calendar so i get the place and i have the picture of the place and i open it up and there's this whole wealth of memories and stories and people that come flooding out and um, all for me represented by these pictures obviously other people are going to bring other their own sort of, as I frequently say, they bring their own agendas to these pictures and they may, you know, obviously they'll mean different things to other people who've, who've known or grown up in these areas, you know what I mean? But 
that's the way I like the artwork to work. It's just like, you know, once it's done and I finish with it, I put it out there and then other people come to it and bring their own stories to it. You know, I, I just I just do my best. And then, you know, obviously it has my own personal slant to it. So just to um, finish off then, we'll just go through a, a few more pictures and I'll show you how the work's developed since then. Um, this is another shot of Mr. G's window. Like I said, I get very sort of obsessive about certain places and, and redo them and, and change them, etc. And this is the center. I mean, this is very pertinent at the moment. I'm the central cinema in, in the city center, which was when I was a kid was a cinema, and then became a bingo, bingo hall for many years. And um, I'm, I think they're trying to make it, well, they're trying to save it at the moment because there's this lovely Art Deco facade and it's on Hobson Street in the city centre. And this is one of the few images that I've, you know, I've used from the city centre. I mean, it, like I say, for me, it reminds me of my childhood and the cinema and I can't remember what I saw there, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang or something, or Where Eagles Dare, something like that. But um yeah, I'd, um, I've actually just started doing a brand new print of this place, which hopefully I'll, I'll get finished in the next few months, and um, we'll see how that goes. Because it's it's become it's become something that's really got a hold in my brain at the moment. I've, I've done a I've recently done a new collage of it, and this is another version of the Romsey Town Labour Club, which I did it in a printed form again with this sort of drawing scribble over it and. There was a guy, I mean, the, some people have said, you know, they looked at my website and they said, well, you know, all your work's very different over the years, etc. I mean, I thought that was, it sort of prompted me to look back at some of the work um, I did years ago and see how it, what it sets up in comparison to this. And I dug up this piece from 1986. And you can see all the scribbly lines on that going on on this print there. And the, there's some words in the image there as well. And this, this prompted me to, um, and along with the writing, to actually think about, you know, what I was doing years ago and, and what I was going to do with some of this imagery now. And um, I um, this, is, this is a book from the same period, 1986, that I did then of sort of etched poems. and. Um, it gave me the idea for this, um, which was a, again is uses an image of Romsey Town Labour Club. I just started using words in the imagery, as well as the black squares and things like that. And then I did this one, which was a image of the old Jenny, which I know doesn't exist anymore. The old Jenny Wren pub, which is right near where my parents live. Oh, they still live in Cambridge over there, which has now been demolished. So I'm, I'm glad I got pictures of it and, and did this piece of work. This is had a had a fence around it at the time, so it's prior to demolition. But um, again, it uses words in the imagery, and I just sort of plucked out words and put them together in no particular thing. It wasn't like a poem or a piece of writing. It was just words that sort of describe how peripheral and sort of on the edge some of these um, areas and places are and um, this was another image of a garage which is out on the A10 towards Water Beach where my dad used to take the, a very old Morris Minor car to get service sometimes it's no longer a garage I think it's part of what is now a campsite but I started making images like this where I sort of instead of keeping them constrained within the rectangular format of the photograph I sort of started breaking out the, the rectangle again as in that piece the 1986 piece so it's like it, I think all the work feeds back into itself you know it's just it's, I, do, I don't see any difference between what I was doing back then and what I'm doing now in some senses but obviously the imagery is very different um, the, then the images became darker I started sticking loads of grit and things in them and using these um, photographs that I had from before, Cheddar's Lane, which reminds me of them, well personally it reminds me of the old skate, skateboard park that used to be there, or it was there for a few years where I used to go skateboarding, obviously it's not there anymore, but it's obviously reminders of the old Museum of Technology or the pumping station as we used to call it then. 
Um, this is a view of the railway again, again with grit and so forth. I'm just trying to, I think I was trying to abstract the image of becoming very literal and photographic in some senses. I was just trying to abstract some of these places. So I started joining two different photographs together in this image and then piling on glue and grit, etc. And then this is a view, this is an actual view of the um, King's Edges Rail Crossing. Um, this is where the Cambridge Regional College is now, but it used to be the track that led up to King's Edges Farm. This is a, a screen grab from an old Super 8 film, and then I'll just um, put some words on top of it as well. And this is the same view done in a collage form. And again, the black forms are there, etc. And then these last few are the most recent. This is a shot, another shot of the St Kilda shops. And I just tried to make it more fragmented, like you would find in a sort of mosaic in a museum or something, these fragments. I'd get the photographs, tear them apart and stick them back together again, and then make them into much smaller items and stick them on these black bits of paper. And this was another very crazy version of the pillbox and the old army depot there. And there's a slight bit of map from the from Arbury above, which I've done. And um, this is the very last one I'll show. And this is a, um, I don't, I think this is Nicholson Way off Arbury Road combined with a photograph of the Kingsway Flats emblem. And then it really got abstracted and sort of has become like this. I mean, I I think for myself, you know, it's it's good to have that sort of development. I did, you know, I think it, you know, I could have got stuck in just producing um, photographs of places with drawings on top of them or, you know, whatever I was doing a few years ago, but I, I do like the work to develop. And, um, and I do see the work as, as very much all part of one thing, the writings part of it, the sculptures, the films, which I haven't shown this evening, but um, they're all very much part of the whole thing and, and part of this whole body of work. Um, so um, I, I don't know. I mean, this is the whole thing about Cambridge and that it's, it's been an, it's been a quite amazing journey. I've met people from my past through this. I met people I used to teach with this. Like I was saying, I mean, people I was at school with have got in contact with me through this. Um, lots of stuff has happened. You know, I've become, become involved in Cambridge again, even though I live in London. You know, I've become very involved in doing exhibitions and talks and so forth. And I'm very happy to do that. It's, it's been a huge uplifting experience for me. It's given me a completely different view like as I, I mean I haven't mentioned this very much in this particular talk but it's just like you know the, some of the memories I had of Cambridge just sat with me for many years I hadn't kind of half buried but I had a very kind of warped view of Cambridge and this has allowed me back into the city and sort of time to reassess my past and sort of see that it wasn't all quite the way I remembered it and there was more to it than I actually remembered by going back and sort of seeing these little places and nooks and crannies that I've I've actually you know been able to sort of build a build a picture of a better picture of the past you know despite having been away from Cambridge for such a long time. So I mean all that's gone on as well. It's been a very fulfilling experience. Um, I'll just read one last thing for you just to finish up, and then we'll have some questions. It's just towards the end of the piece of writing that I did, and um, it just describes um, the end of my time in Cambridge, really. So by now, Cambridge was becoming very familiar again, and my many trips to shoot film footage, install exhibitions, do talks, and generally wander around taking in the sights and experiencing the memories were hugely beneficial. The view across Cove Fen still evokes an idyllic notion of the city as educational centre and gentle pasture, coexisting side by side in the heart of East Anglia. Other aspects of the town centre bring to mind its fame and celebrity, but there are still nooks and crannies where only I and a number of friends would remember the events that took place. On one such evening, I was sidetracked into having a few too many drinks with Stefan in the Rosen Crown, now the punter, on Pound Hill. I was supposed to be on an evening punting trip to celebrate another friend's birthday. 
Richard was friendly with the guys at Scudimore's, so they agreed to rent him a punt for the night. The evening continued and I was very late for the punting trip, so came up with a bright idea to try and catch up with the party, which, had, which was now en route from Magdalen Bridge. I thought I'd be able to see them by following the river along the backs of the colleges, so Stefan and I began dipping in and out of the colleges, climbing onto and over the walls along the river's edge to try and catch sight of the punts. We reached the wall which bordered onto King's College, which was pretty small on one side. I looked over and there was a drop onto the King's side, which at that point in the evening didn't look too high. I climbed over and dropped, suddenly realising on the way down that the ground on the other side was a very uneven slope. I hit the ground and felt my leg go. There was a rush of pain as I tried to get up and collapsed back onto the river bank, staring up into the dark evening sky. I called out to Stefan, who was by now standing on top of the wall trying to gauge what had happened to me. He decided against jumping and went all the way round, out onto the street, back in through King's College and down across the lawns to where I was lying in full view of the famous chapel. Celebrity and commoner in one place. He held me up with his held me up and with his arm around my arm around his neck, he tried to usher me across the grass towards King's entrance. Drunk as we both were, he tried valiantly to carry me, but kept dropping me on my bad leg, which was proving even more, ever more painful as I sought to steady myself and keep upright. Having reached the place where I'd left my bike, I realised my leg was badly swollen and I couldn't even get my boot off. I couldn't cycle, so with a sense of defeat, I found a phone box and called my father. Once we were back home, he cut the laces off my boot and revealed a very discoloured, swollen leg. Then we were off to Addenbrooke's where my leg was x-rayed and set in plaster. This wrote off the next six weeks of the summer break, which in many ways I was thankful for. I didn't have to work for another whole summer as I had done in the years since leaving school. In fact, I didn't have to work at Sainsbury's again, well not in Cambridge. I had to use crutches for a while and managed to get around pretty well, becoming quite adept and speedy. One night after a party in the Argyle Street housing car, I got caught in the rain whilst walking, walking home across Elizabeth Way Bridge. My cast began to disintegrate, leaving a white tra trail on the pavement. Feeling damp, deflated and staring at the fluid white marks dissolving into the path, I felt a sense of acknowledgement that my time in Cambridge was almost over. My cast was reset in plaster and wrapped in a fibreglass type reinforcement and I was told to not come back again. By now my leg was strong enough to allow me to ride my bike and I was out and about at any given opportunity. Nothing was going to impede my social life. This was a journey towards the end as I knew and celebrated the fact that I was leaving for art school, but also harboured some fears of leaving at the same time. My cast came off a few days before my parents dropped myself and my few possessions off at Winchester School of Art. My leg was yellow and withered and I was trying to reacquaint myself with walking on it. In my mind, this was my new life and I was determined not to let my previous existence in Cambridge prevent me from living it to the full. So that seems like a good place to stop. <laughs> so I think I'll leave it there. I'll hand back to Shalise and um, we can maybe have some questions and um, see what happens. <laughs>